Hi, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of our Squiggly Careers podcast. I'm Helen Tupper, and I'm here as ever with Sarah Ellis. Hi, everyone. And this week, we're going to be talking about workplace well-being. It's something that is very close to Sarah and I's hearts, both in terms of how we manage our work. It was one of the founding insights behind Amazing If when we were looking at how people were feeling about their careers and some of the skills that they would need to develop so that they had Uh, confidence and resilience and they knew what made them really happy at work so it's definitely part of how we started the business and also in terms of the people that we coach manage and mentor it is a theme that comes up again and again so I'm really really happy that we're going to be covering this today also over on Instagram over on Instagram I sound like like my mum over on Instagram uh, lots of people on our (laughs) daily Instagram stories they I think I think the cool kids are calling it Insta I think you're fine over over on Insta uh, where it's happening Uh, but anyway (laughs) uh, on our daily Instagram oh, stories. We are so not cool. I know, sorry, <laughs> sorry people. Uh, but the I, I often ask people for um, what would you like us to cover or are there any themes that are top of mind for you? And I have had some repeated requests from people about covering some stuff on mental health and workplace well-being. So hopefully what we talk about today will help you. In terms of what we are going to talk about today and then also why it's important in terms of a squiggly career, I think it's useful for us to touch on that. But what we're going to talk about today are four sort of skills to have to think about your workplace well-being and to manage it. And Sarah and I um, are going to take these four things, which have come directly from an article. Actually, they're not our four things. It's an article um, called The Making of a Corporate Athlete, which does sound a bit um, <laughs> a bit American. And I'm also the least athletic person ever. So it's a bit ironic that I'm talking about it. But it's, I also think we're probably like getting less and less corporate the older we're yeah, both getting. that's very true. <laughs> Making I think a we non-corporate probably both started athlete. off like super, super corporate and like, so there is quite a lot of irony in the title. <laughs> However, it is an incredibly well-researched um, and really interesting article. It's really good. And we'll, we'll link to it when we post the podcast. We'll link to it. The article um, is from 2001, uh, but it is still, it's so relevant and there's so much great stuff mm. in there. And it's written by, um, it's an HBR Harvard Business Review article written by um, two guys, Jim Lure and Tony Schwartz. And we're going to take their four areas of, of how you create workplace well-being. We're going to talk about each one and we're going to talk about Sarah and I's own experiences. And we're actually going to rate ourselves and say for each of these dimensions of workplace (laughs) well-being, this should be fun, we've not talked about this, uh, but we're going to rate ourselves and um, maybe share some reflections on why we have rated each other and um, pass some tips between ourselves, which might be useful for us as well. But hopefully... To be clear, you just said rated each other. We're rating ourselves, right? Well, rate... I'm going to rate myself. I might might, might have my own rating. Well, you you also... Are you gonna, oh, all right, great. We'll see how it goes. Now. <laughs> Look, I'm just like I, I, I'm hoping I sound croaky in like a cool, sophisticated way, but I have actually been like slightly coldy coffee this week, so like I can't, you know, you're like, I'm feeling like the least resilient ever. So I want, I want any nice scores, please. Well, on the sympathy <laughs> vote, I've got a lot of jet lag right now. I've had uh, not a lot. Of, I've just come back from holiday, everybody, and I haven't slept for quite a long no time. Sympathy. No sympathy. No sympathy. So we'll, we'll, we'll trade sympathy. Um, but yeah, so we're going to do that. That's how this, this episode is going to work. Um, and hopefully it might provide a way of you doing this yourself. So you can listen to Sarah and I and think about how you could maybe score yourself and do some of this reflection for you. But before we dive straight into it, um, Sarah, just to maybe touch a little bit on why well-being is so important in squiggly careers. So I think with squiggly careers, part of a squiggly career means that often you are either doing multiple things all at once or you're potentially doing one thing at once. But just the expectation now in terms of the capacity and the that we're kind of expected to have, I think, at work and the level of change and technology, I do think there are kind of multiple things inside and outside of our control that just put way more kind of stress and strain on us every day. And I think because of all of those things, we suddenly now have to work harder ourselves to make sure you know that we are feeling well. You know, and we're going to talk about kind of some of the different aspects of kind of what well actually means. But I do when I do reflect on um, you know careers previously and jobs previously. Now, I mean, I wouldn't change it. I I love the squiggliness, but for me, it does mean that you have... I constantly am thinking about these things and calibrating them to kind of think, right, well, I need to do... I need to take action because this bit's not quite where I'd quite like it to be or how can I improve and kind of get better? Because if you let the squiggliness take over or happen to you, that is when you do get to the point where it can feel really tough and, you know, barely a week goes by, I think, where you don't see a study about we're the most anxious we've ever been. I think particularly there was a study, I think, in the last week or so around, you know, people in their 20s at work and just their levels of 
anxiety to, to do with being at work, you know, how, and, and just, I think that is probably just the ambiguity, the level of change and all the kind of technology, this sort of always onness, which is why you're seeing so many things around the exact opposite, things like digital detoxes and stuff are becoming really fashionable. This just all implies to me that everybody needs to work out for themselves what does it mean for you to be really well? And that will be different for everyone, but we thought we would share for us what that means to us today. And also maybe one thing before we, we dive into the areas, I would say that what we're going to help you to do is about taking control today and sharing our experiences. But obviously, if you feel like you need more help than that, um, mm-hmm. go and seek it. Please, please don't be embarrassed to go and get it. It will make you... Or ask us. Yeah, get in touch with get us and with tell us. us what you're struggling with because I think we actually have a... We're definitely not experts in kind of some of the sort of some areas of kind of mental health and well-being. But I do know five or six people who are absolutely brilliant and exceptionally well qualified. So Helen and I will kind of probably take it about as far as we come by ourselves today. Um, But if you're listening and sort of think that's not enough for me, my challenge is slightly different to that. or I don't feel like you've really addressed the thing that I'm worried about please get in touch and we will absolutely do our best to help and just do that privately. Just send us an email. Um, yeah. You know, we just at get in touch. That's right, isn't it, Helen? At amazingif.com. Yeah. Get in touch at amazingif.com. <laughs> okay. That's great. But yeah, <laughs> well, that would that be really would be bad to say. We really want to hear from you. And here is the fake email address. <laughs> no, no. That is the correct email address. Get in touch at amazingif.com. It'll be completely confidential uh, other than us introducing you if you want us to to, to, to somebody or just giving you links to them. Um, but yeah, I think there's a limit to what we can do and I think we just want to let you know that. But we hopefully there's some actionable things that we can provide with today and if there's additional support that you need we can potentially point you in the right direction so please know that we will support you wherever we can uh, because it's it's important it's it's important to us and really we, um, I think we care about our community so the four areas then to, that we're going to be looking at the first is kind of your physical well-being we're also going to be looking at your emotional well-being your mental well-being and the last one we'll look at is your spiritual well-being at work and we're going to go through each one like i said give each other a score and share some of our own um some, some things that work for us and some things that we think we could be doing a bit differently and just be really honest about that so let's kick off with physical well-being then this so sarah and i haven't given each other the scores i don't know what her score is for of herself for this sarah my score for my physical well-being is i've given myself a four out of ten what's yours okay I gave myself a five out of ten. Oh, okay, okay. So as you're a bit <laughs> so higher, so not great. Then. We're not we're not starting at a high point, are we here? <laughs> not not brilliant. Okay, tell you go first then, because you're a bit higher. This is how this is going to work. Okay, so when I thought about physical well being, I thought about three things: exercise, sleep, and what you eat. And some of these things are slightly more in my control, it has to be said, than than they used to be. So I don't get loads of sleep, but I have a one year old baby who isn't isn't a massive fan of sleeping so I don't blame him for that other than I do definitely blame him for that so my sleep is not great and actually I read so many things through things like um you know Arianna Huffington does lots of things about something called Thrive and she's written a book actually called Thrive and a lot of it is about like the importance of sleep and there's all these research studies that just show just how important it is but I find them really depressing to look at not really like, what you want, what I know, want to read and also I love to sleep um I as some of you will know if you do know me I don't love getting up first thing in the morning and like Helen who's an early riser I'm much better in the evenings so sleep's not great at the moment my kind of eating's okay. I mean, I, I do have a love for, for the curly whirly, which is never going to go away. But, um, and, and that's the start of quite a long list of things that I love that are not very good for you. But my eating's not kind of too bad. My exercise is very different from where it was, partly because of some time constraints that I have at the moment. And partly just because at the moment, and this is definitely something that I could own and do better, I'm not really making the time. So, I love sport, um, I love to play tennis, I love to play netball. After having Max, my little boy, I started doing some running. Um, so I've run a few 10Ks, I'm definitely not a runner. There's definitely runners and non-runners. I'm a non-runner who is okay at running. But um, just in general, I think because I've been at a much better place in terms of my physical well-being, when I compare and contrast, I I think for me, usually I like to feel like I'm a, an eight. I'm always like an eight, aspiring to be a nine, essentially, because you never quite... You know, you're never quite where you want to be. So at the moment, yeah, I feel like there's some things I can't do anything about, but the one thing I could do is just work out how could I create a bit more time for myself to do some exercise, even if that was um, going to a yoga class. Yeah. 
Mine's similar. I took the same three areas, um, so the diet, the the sleep, and the exercise. My diet's pretty good. Um, I so your diet, your diet is amazing. You are totally. <laughs> I was like, if you're not honest about this, I am going to tell everybody because you eat incredibly. Helen's like, uh, you know, one of those like superfood annoying people that you see on Instagram. <laughs> He's just like, oh yeah, I love to eat nuts and berries. I do. I but, do. And she actually does, and it's really annoying. But you, on eating, you'd be like a 9.5 out of 10. However, I knock myself down for my water consumption, so I can't believe my you entire never, actually, you career well-being is coming down to my water consumption. But they, they, they do say it's very important, and oh, the only thing it I is drink important. is coffee and wine, so I'm not up there. With I, do drink, I do drink water. So water, I've brought myself down a little bit for my lack of water consumption. Um, though I do have a cup of turmeric tea in front of me right now, so I'm, I'm trying. Um, my... that, 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 list, that listeners tells you everything you need to know <laughs> about what Helen eats. It's very nice. Puck of turmeric tea, should you wish to indulge. <laughs> but um, my sleep's really good, so I have been blessed with, so far, touch wood, it keeps going. I, I'm able to shut off quite easily at night, no matter what's going on. I also have two young children who who sleeps a bit erratic, but I seem to cope on a bit less sleep than other people. And I, yeah, like Sarah said, I'm an early riser. I would have to be very, very stressed, probably uh, about pe- my family. That would that kind of level of stress, not to sleep. I could seem to actually be able to shut work off quite easily and go to sleep. So that's pretty good. My uh, physical stuff's low, and, and I think it's because a I don't have the passion that you have, Sarah, for a physical exercise. But something that's really important that I took away from the article more generally is the importance of rituals for your well-being, mm. and yeah, whether it's um, we'll, we'll come on to the different ones that you can use. But in exercise, actually having a ritual, so like you do yoga three times a week at seven o'clock or you go to netball on a Thursday whatever that ritual is I don't have that ritual because I've never really connected to exercise and so for me I need to establish it and I do have a desire to I just always deprioritize it so my but I think it would make a real real difference to me when I do do some exercise and I typically like spin classes where you can't get off a bike because they just shout at you so you're like forced to sit it out (laughs) Uh, I like that one and also I sweat a lot so I'm like oh this has done something and I like yoga just because I quite like to I like the ache (laughs) of yoga when I've done it but um I think I just need to find a, a rhythm for me of doing that when I do it I really enjoy it and I definitely feel a lot better for it I just haven't found a sustainable way of of prioritizing it and i do think it's prioritizing i think you've been hard on yourself what i you think four's too low okay from what, what you've just what, said what yeah. I, what, five and a half I, i'd say you're a six. Oh, okay, i'll take it i'll take it it's, it's the yeah, exercise i would say you're a six exercise and water that is my action plan for getting that one up a bit higher it, surely water is like quite easy oh, as well you say you that, should, but it tastes horrible like honestly move what about put like, getting one of those you know the diffuser yeah, things but then you've like, got to have cucumber and lemon anyway it's like probably getting a bit practical Right, let's go on to the next one then. Emotional well-being. What did you give maybe you should Maybe you should go, I went first last time, you go first this time. I, my emotional well-being was 8 out of 10 I gave myself. What about you? Um, all right. Six, six and a half. Okay, okay. So I think on the last one, I think I might have just added the half. You added half. I've about like, myself. Oh gosh, it's gone high. Um, so <laughs> this one was uh, quite interesting when you read read the article. My take about this was about being tuned into your emotions and being able to work with them and not have them work against you so stress for example would be an emotion that potentially could work against you and uh, could make you um in my in my example actually that would be one that if i am particularly stressed i can almost become a bit robotic um and mm-hmm. we talked about this previously in another <laughs> i really laughing. associate that with you do you yeah i can i just sort of become like this robot who's like i've got to get through it i've got to get done and i lose it sorry bit i felt of... like i did an evil plan laugh then I, i'm meant to be supportive actually you know me well <laughs> but we did a if you want to laugh along with this we did a whole podcast on how we both of us deal with stress um previously but other than um so this is about being tuned into your emotions and making you know working with them I am generally pretty aware of how I'm feeling. So if something's not going right for me at work, uh, Sarah used the word calibrate earlier. I find that I can calibrate my emotions quite easily. I can understand when I am not feeling great about something. And uh, another reason that I've scored myself higher for this is I'm absolutely fine in talking to people about it, whether it's a friend or people that I work with or my husband. I... I, I do sometimes use the word I'm fine quite a lot because of that robotic, got to get through it. But generally, if someone sort of probes me or I'll just be like, oh, I'm not feeling great about the situation because of this, I'm quite an open book and I don't, I just, it's just in my nature. 
to be that way. And also in the article, it talks about your body language being, you can use that to positively support you emotionally. How you see me is how I'm feeling, if that makes sense. I'm quite, I'm quite transparent. And it also talked about emotional well-being of having close relationships. And I do, even though I'm quite an extrovert, so I'm, I connect with lots of people, I only have a few very close relationships. And I think of them as... Um, I actually have this weird visualisation of this, Sarah, that I don't think I've ever told you before. But I think about my close relationships, you being one of them, as being um, like... It's like, oh my God, if you're about to tell me that I'm not in that, I'm literally putting <laughs> myself there, down to there. one. <laughs> but I think the, the visual way I think about this is that I... you I can't believe I'm saying this, but that I'm like a hot air balloon and I've got these like tethers, but in a really positive way because I can be a bit flighty and go off in lots of different places. I've got like almost like tethers and anchors that I really rely on to kind of keep me stable or you know kind of you know, know want to be an anchor no in a really nice way no in like a support <laughs> right. helping me to be stable basically when everything else is going a bit crazy who are those people that I can really rely on and I they are my really close relationships so because of that mixture of I think my openness the fact that I'm quite in tune with my emotions the connections I have that support me I've scored myself quite high the bit that I I brought myself down on is that sometimes that that use of I'm fine and my robotic tendencies, if stress sort of creeps in, that's why I've brought myself a bit down on it. So go on, you're, you're six and a half. Yeah, so I think with me, I'm good at understanding my own emotions and I actually feel like I'm good at understanding why other people behave in the way that they do. The challenge that I often have is that I sort of really absorb how other people are feeling. And so, and there's actually a word for this. So when I was um, training to be a like a career coach, and coaching generally, they talk about something called transference, which is essentially some people are more kind of almost like porous. So you, if you spend time with people who are either negative or for whatever reason you find draining, it really kind of comes into you essentially. And you have to work much harder to let it go than some people who are kind of able to almost just let things kind of bounce off them or to understand why and kind of go, oh, and that's fine. And I can, I can move on quickly. So the bit that I always find difficult with the emotional one is I'm very impacted by the people I'm spending time with at that particular moment in time so for this one for me I think I'm quite spiky I think on a good week where things are going well I'm feeling positive you know I've got like positive momentum I can then really quickly like flip up to a nine but actually if something just feels kind of negative to me for whatever reason I quite quickly absorb that know that and even you know I'm really kind of self-aware so I know that I'm doing it I talk to some people about it but because I'm introverted not not loads of people maybe one or two people but pulling myself back out of it takes a bit of time for me even though I know the best way the best technique by the way if anyone is listening is thinking (laughs) yeah that's also me because I overthink things it stays in my head for ages the best thing you can do is to try and go right I'm going to put time limit on this work out what I've learned, only concentrate on the bits that you can worry about and kind of move on. And I also, by the way, give other people this advice, but I do still find even knowing all this stuff and working with other people on it, if I have a bad day or a bad week, it will stay with me for a little while and I I do have to work really hard to sort of boomerang myself back. And I think this is why all of these things are linked because I was reflecting on this. Having had like not a brilliant couple of weeks, you know, some to do with work, some to do with, I mentioned I've been getting some bad migraines and things. So it's not been a brilliant couple of weeks. I often then used to find doing some physical exercise would help me. Physical exercise is one of my boomerangs back. So being able to go and play netball in, which is something that is all consuming. You're so focused on that and you can't think outside of that. I think is really helpful because it's that classic thing of it gives you perspective, it takes you away from all of that other world and it just gives you kind of space. And I think I've probably like lost that thing that used to give me space and actually stop, it used to force me to stop thinking. And I think that's sometimes, if you're like me and I, I know there are people who are you know probably even you know more introverted than me and think about these things way more, if you kind of have that tendency... What is that all-absorbing thing? Someone told me the other day that their mm. thing is they're learning to play the piano. They're having le- piano lessons. And then when they're practising, they're like, it's so hard that essentially you have to kind of dive into it completely. And it's a really good kind of boomerang, I guess. And so, yeah, that that's sort of why I am where I am. And I think the bit that's different for me is I'm now much better at understanding 
why I feel like that. So I never feel bad and don't understand why I have that ability. It's just the bouncing back bit that I sometimes struggle with. There's one thing actually in that article that is good on the emotional bit that I particularly liked in terms of a phrase. They talked about the power of it's something called acting as if. And this was to do with both body language, but also I just think a mindset point around if you do find yourself emotionally quite stressed or you can spot certain emotional triggers, trying to act as if something was true can actually really help you to then for that to actually be true. So to put it into a specific example, let's say I was in a highly challenging or very lots of there was lots of conflict in a meeting, which I never like. If I acted as if I was going, right, I'm going to act as if I'm very calm, collected. I'm going to just find this process interesting, see what I can learn. I was like, I'm going to act as if I'm not going to try and absorb everyone's emotions here. I'm just going to try and act, act as this cool, calm, collected kind of individual. And you might even think about the persona of somebody you know who is like that. Often by thinking that, obviously that that is essentially what then you start to practice and that is what you become. And I just thought it was a really interesting just little technique and little reminder that I think can be really helpful. It's quite spiritual, but there's a book, which I'm not sure you'd love, Sarah, called The Power of Now by Eckhart Tolle. Oh, I know it. And, and yeah, it was, people absolutely love they it, do. don't they? I think, I think it's quite a kind of spiritual, meditative kind of book. But there's a bit in there that I really like, which is about taking control of your emotions by, this is going to sound really odd, but taking yourself out of the emotions. So let's say I'm feeling really upset at work and really frustrated because I've been in a really difficult meeting and there's a lot of conflict that actually almost observing yourself so taking yourself out Mm. of it I mean this is all you're going to do this all in your head right (laughs) it's not a physical thing but you Mm. almost take yourself out of it and think about look at how you are reflecting and how you're reacting and think why what is this trigger because ultimately you are the person this is an emotional reaction from you and you are the person that's in control you might not be in control of the situation but you're in control of how you react to it and so I find that quite useful sometimes I do it in the car on the way home And so I'll be like, I'll be frustrated at something and irritated at a conversation that happened or something. And I'll be like, hang on a minute. If I was watching how I'm feeling, what would I be thinking about this? And why why am I actually feeling like this? What is this actually serving? So it's just, it's a concept we've talked about previously called psychological distance. Um, and you can do it by that, that mm. Eckhart Tolle way of kind of almost looking in on yourself at how you're feeling. That's quite a, like you've got to be, you've got to take the time to do that. Another way is to think about how would I advise somebody else to respond to this situation? And it is just that way of just creating a bit of a bridge from you being in the midst of this emotional turbulence, let's say, and how you can solve for it. Can we move on to number three? Okay. My yeah, number three number is three. like, I'll give myself a higher score. So I feel like I'm like oh, bringing everyone down a bit at the moment. Yeah, so mental well-being, I went eight. I was like, solid eight, happy oh, with that score. It's a good one. I went a bit lower on this one, interestingly. So yeah. I went six. Okay, okay. So in terms of why I scored eight and the kind of, the kind of key criteria that I'd taken from thinking about this was there was quite a lot of talking about, you know, presence, so your ability to be present and kind of in the moment, to focus on what's important, to be able to visualise. And for me, some of these are my natural strengths. So actually, I find visualisation, I'm not sure I'd ever call it visualisation, but I I like to plan ahead and kind of think ahead and to imagine. And, and I like imagining, actually, like, coming up with stuff creating things so actually visualizing things in the future works really well for me as a kind of technique because it's something I naturally do and enjoy and I am good where something is important and you need to be really present and really focus on doing that thing brilliantly so if you've got a really important presentation something to write whatever whatever it might be I'm usually able to kind of spot that it's that it's really important make sure it has the time to kind of make sure I create the time to really focus on that and then make sure I do a really, really good job of that one thing. And a couple of kind of specific examples. I think in terms of visualising, one thing that actually I, I always recommend to other people and I think it is helpful and it links a bit to our podcast around getting promoted as well. I often visualise in a year's time, based on the job that I'm doing now, what are the couple of bullet points that I'll be adding to my CV that aren't there already? which sounds really like specific, but I find that a useful way to think about, am I spending time on learning new things? Am I growing? Am I developing? It's almost like that growth mindset point of, I always like to be continually improving. That's really important to me. And I like to think about 
what will be different by this time next year? And I think I'm sure I've talked about it on the podcast before, but my favourite quote is never live the same year twice. So I think that kind of visualisation helps me to sort of think about, like, you know, what what's going, just what's going to be different. So that's one very specific kind of visualising thing that I do. I was thinking, what, where am I own my own worst enemy? The one thing I do, and I've actually noticed I think I get worse at this, is flicking from social media platform to social media platform so true so quickly and I'm just like this is just and I was doing it the other day I was like this is just ridiculous so you know like you're opening up an app to read see see if you've got any emails you're on Instagram you're opening a different app to see if you've got emails and you're like a personal email or whatever it might be oh quick look on BBC quick look on Twitter and I reckon I've done all those things you know only like in probably 30 seconds and when I reflect on when I do that I'm just like, what am I actually achieving in, in any of those? Because what I'm not doing, I'm not like I'm replying to anything. I'm not absorbing anything. I think I'm just like a bit frantic and a bit frenetic. And I think it's actually becoming a bit habitual because we talked at the start about kind of the impact of technology. And I think technology can be absolutely brilliant in a squiggly career. I think it'd be so useful and empowering. But I also think if it's not used in the right way, it can be really detrimental to well-being generally, productivity, and it's really hard because I think you just, it's this um, like fear of missing out thing, mm. I think. You just get really into like, oh, what's happening there? What's happening there? Well, I mean, it's, it's designed to be addictive. So I'm kind of, there's a, you know, don't, don't uh, beat yourself yeah, up. Yeah, no, there's a bit of, um, there's a bit of a backlash to that now, isn't there? Generally around, you know, Facebook are talking about things like time well spent and yeah. that's going into their like developer platform and stuff. So I think you can stop doing that. Clearly, I could stop doing that. It just takes a bit of willpower because I think you just get really used to it. I think, and um, mine, I'm listening to you. I'm probably a bit higher than I my I put, I put six, but I actually think I'm maybe a bit higher. I've written quite a lot about this, so I write um, monthly for Marketing Week, and I've written a couple of articles which will link uh, one on Zoom in and Zoom out goals, which I'll talk about in a second, and then also I've written one very recently that's gone about um, slowing down to speed up, which is all a bit around multitasking backlash. So I do. I've read that by the way. Oh, it's very good. Oh, thank you. Um, so <laughs> that talks about the, the the kind of points in your day when you might want to think about slowing down. So when you start your day. And and, and when you end your day and also maybe at the start of meetings but for me the, so the things that I do well I do do zoom out and zoom in goals really well so what I started this year with was I had a um like a mantra for the year or a theme for the year which was building a foundation for flexible futures which means a few different things to me it's about my future my flexible futures about other people's flexible futures but I what I then did was I got a page in a book like it's on an A4 page in a book I broke down the year and said what do I need to achieve each month in order to progress me towards what I want that end goal to look like so it's a bit like Sarah's visualization point but I've kind of got it in a grid and then each month I go and tick off those things so it feels like that's what I mean by my my zoom out goal is the foundations for a flexible future and my zoom in goals are those monthly sort of things that I've created so I definitely do some things that help me to have a clear mind about what I'm trying to achieve and how the activities I do relate to that which is all part of this mental well-being but my problem is a bit like yours Sarah and it's not just social media I get distracted really easily and I think why I've scored myself lower is because I'm quite time poor because I fit a lot of things into my life I have I'm kind of my job I'm an amazing if and I have a network that I run for flexible working and children and family I have lots of things squeezing in so I'm really time poor so I, it sort of doubly irritates me when I don't use that time effectively and sometimes particularly like in the office I don't know I, I kind of need to get comfortable with it sometimes I'll feel like I have I'll have put like an hour aside at my desk for example to do some focus work but then people won't have seen me because I'll have been in meetings and they'll come over either just for a bit of a chat or they've got a quick question and before I know it I've only got 15 minutes left to do the actual work and then that's not enough time to do the thing I wanted to do so then I'll just go to my inbox and and that seems to happen quite a lot so I I try to take myself if I've got an hour of focus work to do I actually try and take myself into a room away from other people and I don't take my phone with me because I have the same distractions that Sarah says at work we have um Skype where people can connect you when they see you online so I mark myself as not online because people I'll someone will pop up a message and I'll think oh, I can just help them really quickly but I guess the more time poor I've got the more frustrated I have got with my ability to get distracted because 
the distractions are often often nice things to do. I mean, and obviously it's nice to build relationships and talk to people, but it's potentially taking me away from the more impactful thing I should be doing with that time. And I sometimes struggle with, oh, but should I just be having that casual conversation with someone or should I be actually heads down working on that thing? So that's why I've scored myself down. I've got some got some good processes, but I just feel that my ability to let myself be distracted impacts on my ultimate impact in what I'm trying to do. Yeah, and I think this will only become more important as we are all becoming squigglier, whether you're in one job with four million projects to manage or whether you're in multiple roles or whether you're working part-time and and then you've got other commitments. Actually being really thoughtful about how you use your time and also not apologising for having time to recoup, I think is also really important. So a big focus on the article actually in terms of where they'd um, actually worked with specific individuals on um, all of these different aspects to then try and kind of improve their overall kind of work well-being. There was a real emphasis on kind of almost like when do you have kind of your peak peak performance moments where you need to be really kind of focused and being as brilliant as you possibly can be and then actually where are you going to recoup where are you re-energizing and this is why actually they use the um kind of athlete analogy and actually one of the guys has worked with a lot of athletes because what they'll kind of say is actually the moment when you are needing to be brilliant is often kind of quite sort of short and sharp and then actually you know if you're an athlete the recovery is just as important because if you don't recover properly you can't perform really well the next time and that's the other thing that i think i've become more comfortable with actually over time and probably why i'd score myself an 8 and you know at times probably even higher because i i definitely do recognize there are moments where i think it is okay that i'm just switching off it is okay that i'm recouping and re-energizing in whatever way you know that that works for you because you've got to do that it's, you know, it's like why I think you know, things like holidays and stuff are so important, why I'm adamant that everybody should take all of your holiday allowance that you've got. And, and actually, I get worried if I have teams or people who work with me who are not taking all of their holiday, because, I mean, that's that's one example of where you can go to recoup and re-energise and it gives you time and space to think differently. So there's a, a good article, actually, that um, it obviously it's a very different time from Squiggly Careers. But they talk about how Darwin spent his time. And obviously, you know, he had some pretty incredible outputs. But in terms of how he worked, he was so focused on all of these different things that he used to work for only for 90 minute bursts because he understood that kind of after that, your your focus and your ability to kind of add value, you kind of have diminishing returns. He essentially like worked pretty much on kind of deep focus work just for kind of a couple of 90 minute sprints sort of in the morning always took a really long walk in the afternoon it sounds so idyllic yeah, I, I really love it. basically I, know, I like I really want to like live his life and then he'd come back and just like reply to his letters and I was like oh that's kind of like I was replying to emails but essentially what you see when you see how he diarized his day is he did specific types of work at different times when he knew he would be particularly good at those and I think that's just really smart and I I still think how often do we do that how often do you end up doing little kind of breaking your whole day into loads of component parts and then you never quite do anything brilliant and a modern reference point as well um, <laughs> not that darwin isn't a modern reference point but a, is, a, is a, a person called cal cal newport who has got a book called deep work uh, and has become quite associated with he's a professor at some u.s institution that i can't remember the name of but um the point is he you know he has to do these big impactful research studies and how he manages distractions in his life and there are, so if you're kind of interested in this this concept of deep work i'd, I'd direct you towards his his work <laughs> So last one is on spiritual values and don't get the wrong thing. Oh, so kind of, sorry, spiritual well-being and the, the values is a bit that I took away from this because when I first read spiritual well-being, I was like, oh, religion, Interest, interesting. But actually it's not about that. When you read the um, When you read the article, it talks about, this is about the energy you unleash by tapping into your values and having a strong sense of purpose. So that's what this spiritual well-being is all about. Sarah, what did you score yourself? I found this one the hardest score. This is me like caveating. Well, you should just say the answer, shouldn't you, when someone says yeah. that? But I was kind of, yeah. I was like really going back and forth. <laughs> and so actually, I, I actually went with a nine. Ooh. I know. Having, I've got, I, I, I got started low, but I've, I've, I've crescendoed as we've uh, gone, through, gone through the conversation. <laughs> um, because as you said, I read this as understanding your values 
what motivate and drives you I, I basically i took this into kind of amazing if world and went right i know what motivates and drives me i dedicate lots of time to making sure that that's what i spend my time doing and as much time as, as possible doing and i find lots of creative ways to live my values day in day out so even when i am having a bad day or a bad week the fact that I have amazing if there to support me means that that's a different way for me to live my values. There's lots of things I do in my day job that means I get to live my values the vast majority of the time. And I'm, I'm really lucky to have a job that, you know, most of the time I really love. And so when I sort of started to think about this and the question that we often ask people when we're thinking about values is like, how much are you living your values at work at the moment and what could you do to live them more? When I sort of started to think about this very kind of practically, I do feel like I've probably spent five or six years almost like dedicated to getting to a point where I spend the majority of my time living my values. There are very few examples I can think of now of things that I do where I think I don't get to live one of my values in some way, shape or form. Have we done a podcast just on values, by the way? What have we done or shall we do? Well, well, your answer will determine that the the next point. The reason I'm thinking is people might be listening and thinking, oh, how do I find out my values? And and we... um, I don't know if we have a series of courses on it, but um, if that's something that's interesting to you, if if you'd like, actually, if you're thinking, I'd really like to know more about my values, um, you'd like us to do a podcast episode on it, uh, we're going to do an online course in the not-too-distant future on values, but if if you want a podcast episode, then um, drop us a line at getintouchatamazingif.com and we'll add it to our list, because I'm just thinking as you're talking, Sarah, that it's almost predetermined that people know what their values yes, are in true. order to be able to yeah. use them Yeah, I think that's, work. that's why I score myself so highly because clearly uh, if, if we're going to... Uh, you've got to practice what you preach and all that. Uh, and my one, the reason I don't give myself 10 out of 10, because I think it's fine to give yourself 10 out of 10, <laughs> is they they talk in the article quite a lot about the ability to meditate and actually how powerful it is. And I'm a big fan of things like Headspace, which is an app that kind of helps you to med- meditate in a very sort of accessible 10-minute-a-day type way which I have tried multiple times. I've also tried an app called Calm, which I really like. And in small doses, I really like them. I'll I'll go on and listen to a lovely piece of music or try and do like a guided meditation and I really enjoy it. What I've never been able to do is turn that into a habit. And from everything I've read, it's when kind of meditation and mindfulness is a habit is when it has a really positive impact. My problem is, back to the point around the reason I like physical exercise so much is that it's all absorbing meditation is meant to do that obviously you're meant to be able to kind of clear your mind and be very present and all I ever find is that I am just literally thinking about all the things that I've either not done that I need to do start coming up with ideas and it's so distracting that I find it actually very stressful and I'm sure you kind of have to get through that to get out of the other side but you know what I've never found a way or a tool or a technique or anyone who can teach me that so if you're listening and you're amazing at mindfulness and you kind of get what I've just described because I can't believe I'm that unusual i bet that's the case for lots when of people when was the last time you tried headspace because they've updated some videos on there and have they really... yeah oh, probably so not i tried calm a... more recently which i did really like but i sort of so tried head... it in the wrong situation i tried it on a train and then i was like this is what we're doing i'm an idiot um the headspace app have for everyone who doesn't know about they have a take 10 so basically before you pay for the subscription you can do 10 daily meditations and you select the time now as well sarah so you can select like five minutes 10 minutes uh, maybe i should try and... it again then there's a little video before each one on this kind of like free 10 sessions of meditation and the video one of the videos is about like when you're meditating sometimes it can be like being stood on a road watching the cars go by and your kind of head goes with the cars it's like you're like and then you're like oh back in the back in the room and it, it just it's a, I think it's a very very normal thing and they just talk about techniques for how you re focus your mind on the meditation and not getting distracted by all the thoughts. maybe i'll give it a go because i really like the idea of being 10 out of 10 on something as well Mm -hmm. (laughs) so i i said eight out of ten and i won't i have the same thing as you on values the reason i actually one build on the meditation thing because i have tried it something that i really a book that i like it's quite an easy book to read and it 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 talks around meditation a little bit it's something called the miracle morning by hal enron i want to say or hal elron i think that might be right um you talking about the character out of lord of the rings (laughs) No, I didn't even know there was a character in Lord of the Rings called Hal Enron. Is that? Oh no, he's called El Elron, Lord Elron. <laughs> 
you clearly <laughs> don't have a boyfriend who is a fan of Lord of the Rings. <laughs> we so need to end our podcast tonight with our, with our Lord of the Rings territory. Yeah. But uh, the, the book's a really good book and it just talks about um, a couple of different things that you can do. They talk about it in the morning. So silence, affirmations, meditation, journaling, all of which is quite a lot to fit in. But I actually find the journaling element quite helpful for me to think regularly about my values. But so the reason I've scored myself down is because of purpose, actually. So we have quite a strong purpose with Amazing If, which is getting stronger all the time, actually, in terms of how we're using that purpose. And I I'm still feel like I'm still trying to find my individual purpose of what am I here to... Um, God, that sounds so big, doesn't it? But actually, what, what is the value I put into the world? And I'm just sort of... what if I can feel like I've got an articulation of that in my mind, it helps me, again, it helps me to be more focused and it helps me to pick opportunities that are aligned with that. And we have a very strong one for the business and I'm just trying to work out, do I need to do any more work on that for myself? Or am I, I am, am I, you know, as one of the co-founders of the business, is that also my personal purpose? I feel that once I've got that and I'm really confident in this is the value that I add, this is the impact, this is the dent that I make on the world, to use a Steve Jobs phrase, then I'll feel like I'm, I'm gonna, I'll get to a 10 when I've got that. And I think with these, one of the things I'd really encourage you to do is, firstly, it's really helpful talking this through with somebody. So, you know, find a friend and, and go through the process together because that's a really um, helpful thing to do. And it's, it's quite fun. It's really interesting to see what other people are doing and, you know, they'll have ideas. The other thing to think about is what time scale are you scoring yourself on if you're going to do the scoring exercise? So you can almost use this in a really sort of superficial way to sort of go, oh, this week, this month. And that's actually probably how I use it more. I I do do this constant calibration thing where I'm sort of, because I think you always have to be work in progress on all of them all of the time because nothing will ever be perfect. I don't aspire to 10 out of 10 for each four. I just sort of think, oh, it's good to know where I am and then kind of what I need to do because... You know, it's a bit like the exercise thing. You sort of have moments of being better and then you need to not be, you're not quite so good again, you need to get better again. Or I think you can do it in a more kind of meaningful long-term way and sort of think over the past five years or over the past couple of years, how would I score myself? And I think that would mean that you have quite a different conversation either with yourself or with someone else in terms of where are you and where you want to be. So I think use it in the way that you feel will be most useful for you. So that is it from our four tips from the from the article. Hopefully that's been useful for you to kind of hear about in here, our, our reflections and, you know, as Sarah said, kind of take that as a practice for yourself. Next week, we are going to be talking about uh, introversion and extroversion at work. It's something that we've had from a couple of different people have asked us to cover this. So how you work with introversion or extroversion at work, whether it's you're the extrovert and you want to network better with introverts or likewise, or how you kind of bring your best self to work on those dimensions. So I am more of an extrovert Sarah is more of an introvert so we'll just talk a bit about that and give you some some tips so that you can work with that in terms of getting in touch with us we'd love to hear from our audience so you can email us we've mentioned a few times that's get in touch amazingif.com or on instagram where we're um, amazing if or on twitter where we're amazing underscore if let us know if you've got ideas for future episodes we're very likely to do a q a session again soon we did one of those a couple of months ago where we just take sort of smaller questions that you've got and we'll just a- answer all of those so you can send those to us um, or if you've got any bigger themes let us know and obviously get in touch as we said if you want us to connect you with anybody about any of the kind of uh, mental health work well-being things that you feel we've not really touched on today anything else Sarah before we say goodbye this week no I think we didn't talk about resources as much today because we've obviously based the full podcast on um the article that we'll we'll post as part of the um resources so you'll get that and there are a couple of other articles that we've either referred to or that we found useful as we've been researching this so we'll also post those as always and yeah keep listening keep telling people um I love it I met somebody this week um who listens and she was like everyone I meet I recommend it to (laughs) and she was like and that's at least 10, 10 people in the last week. And I was like, oh, it's so nice to hear that people... And, and this lady works at uh, Brompton, Brompton Bikes. Uh, and she was she was, she was, was like, obviously she's cycling around London, telling everyone how great our podcast well, hello is, to which her I'm very grateful now. for. <laughs> so please do share the podcast if you're enjoying it. Please do give us a rating. As Helen said, it's always really helpful for us and means we can keep doing these every week. And we really do love your feedback. Um, it's so rewarding to know that Helen and I are not just... Um, on a Sunday night having to sit in a very very hot room recording this podcast because we're not allowed to have any windows open um, to know that it's worth it and that I might not be doing much physical exercise at the moment but I feel like I might have lost a couple of pounds in the last hour or so <laughs> yeah me too <laughs> and on that lovely sweaty note uh, yeah. we will leave you to your week and we'll be back with you soon bye everyone bye. see you soon